can I paint a model and film it and edit it in a single day? I'm not really sure. You will know. But I'm going to try. So when it comes to getting models done really, really fast, especially when, say, you're trying to get a gift for somebody, you gotta sometimes make some compromises. I got this here little apothecary dude, which hopefully will autofocus. I decided to do it as a gift for one of my people I know, mainly because he's going in for surgery. So I needed to get this thing done quickly because I have a lot of other projects that I'm working on right now. So sometimes you gotta just get the job done without having to do it super well. You have to figure out what you can do in the time that you're given and maximize the amount of impressive stuff that you can put into it during that time period. That means freehand, designs, lighting effects, things like vases and such may be nice for people who are going to look at models up close and personal, but sometimes you just have to get things done. So with that being said, let's actually get to getting the model done. With short time periods to work on projects, the emphasis of a project goes into maximizing visual impact with as many tricks as possible in a given time frame. For this reason, I chose a white scars theme on this apothecary to maximize his visual impact, as white is a challenging tone for beginners. Additionally, I have painted white scars before and thus have good experience of the shape of their iconography. Maximizing my ability to paint something impressive and not challenging my skill set, and thus slowing myself down. White as a color is challenging not only because it lacks any hue, but because it is very dependent on the environment for its midtones and shadows. A modality of thinking outside the mindset of a beginner. To begin painting white, you need to have a solid idea of the surrounding area of your subject, so the colors of light reflecting off of them can color the midtones and shadows of your white subject. Here I think the model on a flat brown battlefield, on a mildly overcast day. Beginning the process of mount, hazelnut brown. White objects will appear to be the lightest thing in a composition, so we don't need a super dark starting place to paint them. A more metallic or satin finish on the armor would necessitate a darker beginning point, but as I think of the model being made from ceramide, it will be matte, and thus a darker beginning point is not needed. Next the scale is scale of a rainy gray. I stick with matte tones for the most part to keep the effect consistent on my painting. This gray hue will act as a mid-tone for my white and set the beginnings for the effect. As the model contains a light and a visual story, I like to incorporate an OSL effect within the painting. As illuminated areas are naturally brighter than the surrounding ones, and because white is as bright as I can go in a painting, my white will be ever so slightly grayer than a full-blown titanium white. The visual context of the painting, however, will still read as white armor. Scale 75... The car? NASCAR? N NASCARs! NASCARs are next. A slightly warmer off-white tone. With matte colors, especially light ones, you have to be pretty careful in the dilution, as they can easily speckle only very small dots. For my purposes, this is not desired, so I add in a fair amount of thinner and flow improver to the mix, making the mix a bit easier in this regard. I start defining my volumes over the model of this tone, letting some areas remain dark and gray and letting the lighter areas come forth towards the viewer. I use pure white next. I like Holbin ink for its more matte finish over something like Liquitex, which I found to be a bit too satin. I mix my ink with thinner and flow improver before testing it out on a surface. You may notice me time to time spraying my cutting mat with paint. This is partially to let out blockages and mainly to test the consistency of the paint as it flows. If the paint splays out like a spider web, it contains too much thinner and will be hard to control and dries slow and glossy. Too thick will result in speckles that give unwanted visual noise to a model, so spraying on a surface is a practical way to test the paint. With the white, I try to set my highlights to define the shapes of the model further. For this, a very tight control over the airbrush is needed, laying only a tiny amount of paint out during spray. The model is really beginning to take the appearance of white now, but you can see that the model is not uniformly one shade of white, and brown and gray areas are all over the model. Even on the highest points of white, they are really just a step down or two from the idea of a pure white. With the white done, I can now put down my lighting effect. I want a greenish yellow like an industrial fluorescent tube, 
so I used Striking Scorpion Green and some yellow ink here. I add a large amount of thinner to this, as I will work very thin and these tones have very strong coverage, so I don't want to push the color too hard. Yellow may be the most luminous color, and thus the best for OSL effects, but as I am painting over white, I had to be very careful not to oversaturate the area, which could bring lightness down to confusing looks. With armor done, I move on to accoutrements. I use Blood Angels Red, Imperial Fist, Skeleton Horde, Payne's Gray Ink, and some Durolimnium. I mix some Payne's Gray into my Durolimnium to improve the flow and give it a subtle cool note, and cover my metallic elements on the model. For models where the metal is not a large factor, or speed paints, I find it sufficient to apply a single coat and let the metallic effect work for its highlights and shadows. Blood Angels Red for the trim, front cloak, and some of the cables. I found that painting over metal components of contrast, provided they are dry, creates an interesting effect, almost as if the metal cable were covered in a clear plastic coat. I suppose, well, now that I say it out loud, that this is exactly what is happening. Imperial Fist goes on the heraldry and the cables. And Skeleton Horn for leather bags and skulls. This was easy. Gilliman Flesh for the face, some additional red for the gene seed, and a bit of the first blue I could find for the lenses. I then cut in the straps and joints of carbon black. If you remember my last video, I like to use this color in speed paints as it naturally reflects a large amount of light and creates visual depth without the need for additional work. I then use the same color to add some random scratches and dents to the armor, increasing its depth just a bit. Time for freehand. I want to put in some of the iconic zigzags the white scars are known for over the armor. For this, I use nothing but a good brush and some Blood Angels Red. For those interested or intimidated by freehanding, this is a very good place to start. Geometric patterns that are not based on parallel lines have a lot of forgiveness in their designs, and using a fluid but highly staining paint like contrast can help in the physical painting action. The resulting finish is easily refined with quote unquote real paint in later stages. The only problem is painting over a dark base. You had to use opaques for this, and thus this is not an effective approach. But it can be a good way to get your proverbial cold feet in the door and warm them up. Before I go in with a brush, I want to set some definition on the model, so I use some oil washes. I use Lamp Black and Payne's Gray, a deep black blue for this. This only base sets the occlusion shadows on the model and greatly defines the various panels and lines it has. An occlusion shadow is a result of two objects coming closer together, reducing the amount of light that can come between them. Thus, when two objects come close together, they will form a very dark line. This is one of the few times black shadows occur in nature, and oil washes help set this aspect of verisimilitude. Time for brushwork. I set my palette of acrylic gouache for its matte finish. I use raw sienna, titanium white, quinacridone red, Benzamazadalone, Benzamazadal, Benzam, Benzami, Benz, Benzamidalzolone, Benzamazadalone. How the fuck do you say this? Benzamidazolone yellow, unbleached titanium, and ivory black. For getting stuck paint pots open, I strongly suggest you buy a pottery awl. It is better in handling than a paperclip. Skin is quickly rendered with some raw sienna and white, with a little bit of unbleached titanium thrown in at some points. Here, I'm mostly getting the front view and not rendering the face super intensely, as the armor is more the focus of the show here. Quinacridone Red covers most of my red elements, and I specifically paint my cloak in a choppy pattern to mimic the look of a rough cloth and monastic robe. I work my lighting effect with nothing but yellow and white, defining edges and increasing values where I find unnecessary. I mix a gradient with some black, brown, and white to start rendering my armor. The white near the bottom of the body will naturally be a bit darker than those closer to the light source, namely the top of the model. Here, the painting is not so much a challenge, but knowing where to place certain highlights. A pure white highlight on the knee, for example, looks rather out of place in comparison to that of the neck. And I quickly finish off with a bit of environmental painting, setting up some highlights and dirt on the model's feet and legs. 
Finally, why not flex a little bit and freehand a simple flower onto the model's open shoulder pad? This is certainly a subject for later, but know now that freehanding is not such a difficult thing when you're given the necessary tools for success. Foremost is the understanding of what shape the object you want to paint is, as painting requires an understanding of the edges and volumes of subjects. With painting traditionally, we are effectively drawing and coloring at the same time, rather than separately. This means that you need to know where the boundaries of your subjects are, and know the nature of the color they are. From there, it is all a matter of refinement. And here is the final result. While certain details are missing, overall I am pleased with the amount of things I was able to squeeze into a two hour paint job with the amount of components, various free hands, and difficulties of working with a difficult tone. But more importantly, you can see that all you need to do to make something of this nature better is just to take longer. If you like this video, please consider subscribing, liking, and doing all the rest of those actions that you've heard no, God knows how many other times. Take care and have a good one.